Uh, first council is uh, council for Erin O'Toole. Mr. Jarvin. Mr. Medicino, my name is Tom Jarman and I represent Aaron O'Toole. Uh, my questions today are largely going to be procedural. So, um, you know, to the extent where I ask about warrants, it's not about any particular warrant and I'm not interested in details with respect to that. Um, so as Minister of Public Safety, you sat at the apex of four large departments and three smaller ones totaling probably about 65,000 employees. Is that correct? Yes, just to um, be demonstrative uh, about those departments, it's the RCMP, CSIS, CBSA, uh, uh, Pardons Canada, and obviously the Public Safety Ministry itself. Yes, uh, and Correctional Services Canada. And Correctional Services of yeah. Canada, yes, thank you. And uh, you had exempt staff that were hired by you to assist you in provide dealing with those departments. Yes. Is that correct? And their existence is, or their employment is contingent upon you being the minister. In other words, when your term as minister ends, their employment ends subject to them being picked up by another minister. I think that's roughly accurate, yes. Okay. And you, uh, so the chief among those, or the most senior among those, is the person designated as your chief of staff? Correct. And were you given direction as to whom should be hired as your chief of staff by the Prime Minister's office? No. Were you, did the Prime Minister's office exercise approval over the person you designated? I, I would say it's a conversation between the Minister and the Prime Minister's office, and certainly there's input from both sides, uh, but the Minister does and should have input into who their Chief of Staff is. Okay, thank you. And I'm assuming that some one member of your staff was directed to uh, have responsibility for the handling of matters related to national security, and in particular warrants, is that correct? I would say that that's roughly accurate as well, that within the political staff that certain tasks were given to individuals to take on a file, for example, uh, handling CSIS warrants and making sure that the minister is properly briefed, getting the appropriate intelligence uh, as we take those decisions, yes. So you're Minister of Public Safety from October 21 to, I believe, uh, June of 23. Um, and so I'll use the insert. July, sorry to correct, July of 23. July of 23, sorry. Um, the INSERA 22 annual report says that in 2022, there were 28 uh, warrants uh, approved. Uh, is that consistent with your recollection of, the, of that year? You can appreciate I didn't keep a, a running tally, but I have no reason to dispute that. And I assume that they had access to the precise number. So that, that, that sounds about right. I just don't have the exact number in front of me. Yeah, so, so that would suggest there's a relatively frequent rhythm of those materials showing up in your office. I think that's a fair statement. And would the same person have been assigned as a general rule to uh, reviewing warrants? N not necessarily. It would depend on um, staffing and whether or not people were on leave. But I can assure you that in the course of my time as minister that uh, we had personnel assigned uh, for the flow of information and intelligence in support of decisions related to CSIS warrants. And what direction did you give to your staff regarding the qualifications of the people assigned to provide you advice with respect to warrants? Well, first, that they had to be properly cleared and vetted uh, because the information was highly classified, very sensitive, and as I described just before our recess, um, the stakes are as high as they get. Um, lives hang in the balance. So one, they had to be properly cleared uh, by our intelligence and public safety officials. Second, uh, they had to demonstrate uh, some critical uh, analysis skills. They had to be good reads, quick reads, and be able to take a lot of information and distill it down to recommendations and advice. And, you know, to state the obvious, this is a very complex area. Um, the law as it applies to cease and warrants is not easy. Um, understanding principles like investigative necessity, the duty of candor that is owed to the court, full, fair, and frank disclosure, those are not easy concepts. And especially when you mesh that against the reality that, that foreign interference has become far more pervasive and is rapidly evolving, um, we really wanted to be sure that you know, we had people who could take that information and distill it back to me when they were giving advice. And in fact, uh, oh, Section 21, a warrant under Section 21, by definition, involves an infringement of someone's rights. 
Well, uh, look, there. this is an important question and I don't want to gloss over it, but the court and the Minister of Public Safety who plays a gatekeeping function before those thesis application goes to court uh, undertakes a balancing exercise. So everyone has a right to be guarded against an unreasonable search and seizure under Section 8 of the Charter, but embedded within that are judicially authorized warrants. Yes. And so the court undertakes a careful balancing. I am reluctant to say that a properly authorized warrant first screened by the Minister of Public Safety, subsequently approved by a court, amounts to an infringement of anyone's rights. Let me put it this way. It involves an activity that, if it were not judicially approved, would be an infringement of something. I think that's closer to the truth, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, and so, in ensuring those warrants were properly reviewed, and you, I assume, accept your, expect your staff to make sure that the warrant was reviewed in its entirety and that questions were asked and the premises were tested. Is that correct? Well, not just my staff. I I wrote those warrants. I read them. I read them very carefully. Um, I read them with detailed notes, and I put questions back to my officials where I had them to ensure that the requirements under the law were met. This was, in my opinion, one of the most serious and solemn responsibilities that I had because of the sensitivity of the information and the threats that we were trying to mitigate through the authorization of these warrants. So, I took this assi this part of my assignment extremely seriously. I knew that lives can and do hang in the balance, and therefore uh, we made sure that we got those decisions right to the extent that we could. You left to my next question, but my first question was, what did you expect your staff to do? To make sure that I was getting the paper that I needed to take those decisions, so the intelligence to support it, um, to make sure that I was getting the advice that I needed from my department. And I would just say, we spent a lot of time talking about my political staff. My deputy minister also played a critically important role in this. As the unelected representative of the public safety ministry, my deputy minister provided me with recommendations as to whether or not to agree with the approval of the CSIS warrant to go to court. And there were discussions and backs and forths uh, based on my careful reading of those warrants before I signed off. So it wasn't just political staff that were playing this role. I also had the benefit of very sound advice from my officials uh, that were led by the deputy minister. And that having been said, uh, we've heard uh, previous evidence that the typical turnaround time in your predecessor's office, it was between four and ten days, or four and eight days, depending upon which statement is being read. Would that be a turnaround time consistent with your office, too? I understand that that is the evidence that the commission has heard, um, and I, you know, would just simply say that we prioritized CSIS warrants during my tenure. Um, when they came up, uh, they were put on my desk. Uh, without any undue delay, and I made sure to take the time that was necessary to read them and to put questions back that really centralized around the requirements of the law. And the reason why I wanted to prioritize this work was, one, I knew what was at stake in terms of our national security and the people who put their lives in harm's way every day to protect it. But two, I was also mindful of the requirements that the court uh, had articulated in a number of decisions around the duty of candor. So this was not easy work, and it was not work that could be rushed, but it was a top priority during my time as Minister of Public Safety. So absent questions from you about a warrant, you would have expected that warrant to show up before you for consideration in that four to ten day period. Well, again, uh, it was, it, in my experience, the warrants, they, there was a rhythm to it. I think that's an appropriate way to, to characterize it. And there were no undue delays in the approvals of warrants uh, during my tenure as public safety minister. And it would have been exceptional for a warrant to sit uh, in your office without being tended to or placed before you uh, for more than two or three weeks. Certainly that, that was my experience. But again, I, I do want to point out that there will be circumstances where there can and should be a back and forth between the minister and uh, his or her officials, and for good reason. If you don't take this exercise seriously, then mistakes get made. The requirements of the law may not be met. And 
I think your point earlier about infringements of people's charter rights have to be taken into consideration, especially when we're talking about the right to be guarded against unreasonable search and seizure, especially when we're talking about our obligation to the court so that there is full, fair, and frank disclosure about all of the intelligence that is being put before it to authorize what is a very um, important and necessary investigative technique to guard against uh, any threats to our national security. So the point that I'm making is I, I don't think that there is a hard and fast rule around the number of days when it comes to the approval of warrants. All I can tell you is that in my time, I made sure that they got to me, I reviewed them, I put questions back, and we got to a point where I was comfortable taking a decision. I'd like to conclude with two questions, Minister. Uh, the first one is, when deciding whether or not to approve a warrant, and the CSIS Act says that your approval is a precondition of the warrant being presented, what factors did you consider in, in deciding that choice, making that choice? In terms of whether or not to approve it? Yes. All of the legal principles that we've already discussed and they're set out in the law very carefully. So I would take all of those into uh, consideration, and I would be sure that if I had any questions about whether or not those principles were met, that I put them back to my officials. And I can tell you, in my experience, those conversations were very helpful to me. They were very constructive, because typically I found that CSIS was responsive to any concerns that I'd raised. And we all knew that it was in our mutual interest that we put the best possible product before the court so that we reached the right decision. And finally, if the staff member you'd assigned to review the warrant had a personal relationship with someone who's either the target of the warrant or mentioned in the warrant, would you have expected them to turn that responsibility over to someone else? Yes, and we've touched on it during my uh, e examination with Commission Council, and I do think that there needs to be a constant vigilance around any potential abuses from the elected side of government when taking decisions around foreign interference and political actors. And I very much you know, look forward to um, what you have to say about that, Your Honour, in, in your final report. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, sir. Thank you.